Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for coming in room B. Thank you, Genexus, for this invitation. Uh, thank you, Marcelo, for this organization. Gustavo, particularly because I thought about this title and I thought that they were going to say no because it was going to be aggressive and luckily it stayed on. Uh, Nicolás Jodal uh, was someone I met on just on the on in 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 the lift and um, and I said that of course I knew this company but I had never thought about how important this event was until now and I saw the n large number of people coming up and out of the lifts and the rooms you can very well imagine that I feel a little bit weird here because I'm not an engineer I'm not an expert I'm not technician I'm not I'm in no commercial area I don't understand about programming and better programming but at the same time I'm very happy because I think that those who can live in these intersections of different specialities have something to contribute and say in today's world particularly to uh, uh, claim uh, against those smoke sellers that are somewhere around. And a way of detecting them is to see whether they've got a track record behind them to sustain them, because otherwise they are not smoke sellers. En esta, en estos minutos. And this is what I'm going to try and explain um, in, in, in these few minutes. Um, the story that makes you do things well, restricts you, places you in a place uh, where it forces you to come out of your of our routines. Those who work in uh, Genexus, uh, those who work in the media, those who work in a ministry, in a drugstore, wherever, in a hospital. We are all working with a certain routine where life goes on and weeks pass and uh, planning what you have to do in that week or month or six months. The introduction of history there uh, makes you come out of that zone and um, gives you bearing, weight, force. It makes you the power of doing become substantial. And let me tell you a story about that, which I discovered by reading a, a journal of um, literary journalism called Etiqueta Negra, Black Label. It was about a, a man who was in Japan in a five-star hotel wait, uh, waiting for uh, his um, customers to come in and buy his new collection of silk handkerchiefs and kerchiefs and he was waiting for them there and he said very deep inside what am I doing here I don't like what I'm doing I don't like the world of fashion we're talking about uh, a, a French gentleman called Christophe uh, he was 34 years old then he had a meeting with the Japanese he went back to Japan he ab abandoned the company and went to uh, Polytechnic in uh, Paris Called, uh, to, to study bread and become a uh, bread maker. And he realized uh, that the recipe whereby uh, the baguettes in France uh, became famous is not the original recipe. Uh, the way of making the dough required other types of uh, ingredients and some other more time um, for the yeast and uh, he founded a, a bakery uh, called Dupin et des Idées and he put his flagship um, bread called uh, Le Pain des Amis uh, which is um, two euros and uh, takes two days for the yeast. Um, as you know there is an annual baguette festival in uh, Paris and uh, if you win you will be the bread provider to the Elysee Palace to the presidential palace the first thing they take into account is the aspect the second the second one is the cortex the 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 crumbs and the, and the holes inside the sound they they would they would break it and most certainly you know the sound that a good baguette makes the, the smell and the taste. Christophe Boisser won first prize in the Baguette Festival. He 
his bakery is within 44 uh, bakeries in Paris, not using any frozen um, product. He never expanded. He's only working with the Japanese uh, employees. Although he abandoned the fashion uh, world, he said that there's a question of tradition and respect of recipe, and that's why he likes the Japanese and not the uh, French uh, bakers. He's, he's not a very charming man. He doesn't come out in the, in the press very often. But this is the first story I wanted to share with you. First of all, because he makes bread. He makes bread. He, he, he's not making it. Oh, he makes bread. And he talks about the black legend that it uh, um, fattens you and it's a uh, cancer. Uh, but it, it's got phosphorus and good magnesium. You know, as everything in life, if you use it uh, within a certain framework, it's not only doing you nothing wrong, but it's delicious. And there's a whole world around that, which is so simple, that is bread. And Christophe entered that world. Why doesn't he sell smoke? Well, because he uh, he entered the world, and um, there is a very moving part of his story. Uh, the first time he made a, a test in the, in, at, at the Polytechnic, and he said that the first time he touched the flower, it was a whole internal journey. He remembered his grandmother, and there are a whole there are many stories behind that. And it's not that he opened up a baker's because uh, I, I'm French and I want to make baguettes. No. I mean, he wasted time in order to save time later on. And that's one of the most important things. You, you don't have to hurry up in life because many times those who get there first are the ones that go more slowly because they go around uh, the story. And uh, an enormous risk is to sell smoke. When you put the brake and, uh, and you say, where is this coming from? You know, the French Revolution, we are all children of the French Revolution, started with the bakers going against the Versailles Palace because the France of that time said that if you don't eat bread, you're not well fed. And Louis XVI said, look, you can get fed without eating bread. But at the mindset at that time, that wasn't conceived. And so there's a whole very intricate story that makes you have a certain force and, uh, and, and what you do and what you focus on. We make bread and we've been making bread for 3,500 years, as you may know, uh, you know, dates are not exact, but 3,500 years ago, we invented the oven. And the first thing that we did in ovens was bread and, uh, and bricks. And that's what I want to talk about as well today. My presentation is about uh, Christophe Boisser, about uh, bread, and a very short story about bricks. Bricks, the, the, the shape they have at present, um, have been invented, were invented 10,000 years ago in Jericho, but um, a, a very important change uh, was produced in 3,500 years ago when the oven was invented, and that's the link between bricks and bread. And so they, they started um, cooking bricks. They were made with adobe, and they had a sort of uh, um, cooking at 800 Celsius, um, degrees Celsius with the consistency that we all know. I'm sure that all of you have at some point in time taken up a brick. And so I started cooking it in Naples using uh, some ashes from the Vesuvius, you know, the volcano uh, in Naples with some uh, um, uh, lime stone. Richard Seneth, an anthropologist with a fantastic book called uh, The Artisan, where he compares those making bricks with those programming software. Let me warn you about it. They say, he says it's the same thing. And I want to wink an eye and tell you why. Well, um, he says that the Roman Empire is the empire of brick. It invented the half-point arch when you've seen the aqueducts. As Rome was building its empire, it was carrying along bricks. It would make the roads. It would, um, it, 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 bricks would make um, uh, the, the, the aqueducts. He means the soich, the cisterns. I'm sorry, I didn't find the word, says the speaker. Uh, all that was made 
of bricks and he says bricks like like uh, bread uh, when i was preparing my talk on the 25th uh, floor, uh, you know, the construction that is being built opposite um, showed me bricks, you know, the construction 3,500 years ago, you know, bricks is at human scale. It is made because it, it fits in your hand. We can all take hold of a brick with your hand. And when you see an enormous wall made of bricks, what you see is the sum of human effects. And brick makers in old Rome did something that is difficult for us to understand. Uh, they would sign their bricks, but not with their name. They said fecit, which in Latin means I am or I've been here. A signature without a name. Senate says that there is something similar that programmers do. They make software and those who don't know it don't even find out about it, but we use it. In the same way, brick layers are uh, holding the spaces where we live, and they would sign it with this very particular thing, which is just to leave a sign, just to leave trace of you by saying, I've been here. And why am I telling you this about bricks? Because we, and when I say we, I mean those of us who are Uruguayans, because here in the room there are people from abroad. We have Eladio Dieste. Eladio Dieste is an engineer um, that we study about, uh, you know, in the School of Architectures all over the world, the intersection, the spaces, and our He's an engineer. There's a new construction system, a new way of looking where the light came in. He took the brick and he innovated um, the vaults by the estate, and I have here dotted down the, the, the names of the countries where uh, his uh, uh, ar ar architecture buildings are in New York, Bogota, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, London, Munich, Miami, Edinburgh, Sevilla, and Massachusetts. In all these cities, there are people who are studying the estate's works. And what did he do? Well, he took up bricks, and he said he took up an ancestral material in a country where there was manpower who knew how to work with bricks to project an innovation. An innovation that for Eladio Dieste was held by tradition. Smoke sellers don't have history because they don't know what tradition is all about. They think that their generation invented everything and has all the answers, and they don't know how to go into into this storyline. Someone like uh, Eladio Dieste, like Christophe Besov, like uh, those who realize that we are supported by generations before us who um, give us the legacy of a tradition that we have to innovate. What Dieste did was new, but he did it with bricks which are 10,000 years old, 10,000 years old. I'm repeating this because in this type of activities, and those of ours in the media can see how these things are accelerating. 10 years ago seemed to us very surprising. You know, um, you listen to the noise of the first internet. It's prehistory, but it's, it's incredible what's happening, everything that is projected. But it's also incredible to see how this time there, uh, there is a steel bread and there are steel bricks because we are there. We are in those stories and we are in those storylines, in those plots. And he said tradition is the springboard to innovate, referring to engineering and architecture or in everything. A very large advantage of going into these historical plots is this question that restricts, you know, look, everything you have to read and study, and at the same time, it's the springboard for someone who's going to do new things. There is no Einstein without Newton. There is no Piazzolla without Gardel. There is no Gaudi without classic architecture. I'm not defending tradition here. Uh, let's innovate. Let's do everything new. This is the large opportunity of doing whatever we want with uh, 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 artificial intelligence. But history is the springboard. Without a springboard, we are running the risk of selling smoke. Now, the third lesson that uh, history teaches us is intersubjectivity. 
When I say we, I don't mean Uruguay, but I mean the Western culture is very much supported on figures. Some of them are found in the Western culture. Some societies are very much embedded in this. I don't know if you have friends from Argentina here in the room, but Argentinians are many are, you know, very traditional. They think that everything depended on Peru, um, or everything depends on Messi, or humor it depends on Olmedo. It's God and all the re they are God and all the rest we are around him. But not like that. But as the Western world, um, we have these uh, central figures, um, Christophe, um, Eladio di Este. But what history teaches you is the framework of people around process. Of course, there are outstanding people. There is no Genexus without Brogan or Nicolas, but there is no Genexus without a team. I'm not saying this because it's um, here. This can apl be applied to the functioning of any organization. And it is in that functioning, when there is not only one, but many, once again, what we tissue is the stories. What we knit is the stories. I don't know if you know how your parents met, but without there being their meeting, you wouldn't be here. And sometimes they met because of very um, surprising uh, facts. Uh, you know, you didn't go to that event, but you did because a friend of yours uh, came to pick you up, and that's where you met my mother. And I'm here because, uh, you know, and that's history. And it's a history that makes you go back. And because we are a land of immigrants, why is it that they came by ship? And what did they do? And, uh, and what were they doing there? And why were they obsessed by money when they came here? And why were they so that I had to have a university a student and I had a, a baker so that you could become an engineer. And that's history. And that is also a way where you stop. I was discussing this with Alvaro, who's around here. We were classmates at the university. And we are at a turning point where most certainly our children and most certainly our grandchildren, university is going to be something completely different from what uh, we know. Courses in the way we know them are being changed. And the people who are doing interesting things are doing things that apply to eight or nine or classical courses. I studied medicine, a little bit of chemistry and engineering. And uh, you know, it's clear that the university in that sense is, is changing and will continue changing. But it's also true that all those who do something and get something are successful and with this intersubjectivity stopped. And the university is precisely, historically, that place. It's the place where you put the break, where you stop, where you think, where you interconnect, where you have these layers of history. And at the same time, people uh, meet one another. They become in love. They, you know, interpersonal stories are woven. Uh, we don't know how we're going to come out of that. There are going to be credits that are intercrossed with subjects that you can do in different universities um, as they used to be. Philosophy and engineering were separate and uh, or are separate, like medicine and computing. You know, it's clear. It's already there, even though the university is lagging behind a little bit. But it's also clear that we have to put a break that we haven't invented everything, that we have this impulse of intersubjective stories of materials that are, have been there for millennia. And because we go on eating bread, those of us who had lunch, you know, we, we didn't want to get fat and we, we ate a little bit, but the bread was there and the bricks are there. And it's true that we are changing and there are new ways of building and there are new ways of uh, baking that, those bricks, but they are there. That's it. That's what I wanted to convey to you, uh, to convey that message and share it with you, because the, the, what we need the most, not to sell smoke, is to dive in all these stories that each one of you has. Thank you.